American society continued to remain divided on racial lines even after the abolition of slavery. Separate rules governed people of color in all walks of social life, including restaurants, hospitals, workplaces, and schools. The freedom and equality we enjoy today is the result of countless struggles by many people against such discrimination. One of these struggles is the landmark Supreme Court case, Brown v. Board of Education, that took a pivotal stand against the segregation of society. Between the late 19th century and the mid-1960s, all major American political institutions supported the oppression of colored people. They were governed by the Jim Crow system, which declared that whites were superior to blacks in intelligence, morality, and civilized behavior. For example, the separate car law in Louisiana legalized the segregation of people by color into compartments during travel. The law was challenged in 1891, resulting in the Supreme Court case Plessy v. Ferguson. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court upheld held the law and declared that as long as the state governments provided equal freedom and legal process for both blacks and whites, they could continue to maintain separate institutions. This further solidified the idea of separate but equal societies for blacks, from restrooms to schools and hospitals to workplaces. But separate was never equal, and segregation contradicted equality, liberty, and freedom, three fundamental pillars of the American dream. Many civil liberties groups across the country fought to eliminate these separate but equal laws. One such group, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, referred to as the NAACP, enlisted 13 parent volunteers to initiate a case against the Board of Education in Topeka, Kansas. These plaintiffs in Topeka did not only assert that their school's facilities were inferior, but also that segregation by color was psychologically and educationally damaging to their children, as it isolated them from other children in the community. Oliver Leon Brown, one of the parent volunteers, argued that every day his daughter Linda was forced to walk to her all-black school, which was an hour away from her home, despite an all-white school being in their own neighborhood. Brown, along with 12 other parents, tried to enroll his child to the school, but was denied admission. These parents consequently filed a lawsuit against the Topeka Board of Education on behalf of their 20 children in February of 1951. Similarly, Prince Edward County in Virginia had only one all-black school, Moton High School, which was overcrowded and had a paucity of supplies and books. A small group of students, with the help of the NAACP, staged a two-week protest and at the fore was 16-year-old Barbara Johns, who famously proclaimed, the town jail isn't big enough to hold all of us. Both the Topeka outcry and the Prince Edward County protest eventually made it into the Supreme Court alongside three similar cases in Delaware, South Carolina, and the District of Columbia. These five cases collectively became known as Brown v. Board of Education. The NAACP served as a platform that not only connected the folks who suffered the consequences of separate but equal institutions, but also attracted capable leaders and obtained public support for the case. Thurgood Marshall, head of the organization and first Black Justice of the Supreme Court, helped each of these local cases by hiring some of his best attorneys available. Even though there are a lot of characters that played a part in the story, there's no question that Thurgood Marshall was the most central figure to the case. You know, Thurgood Marshall would go on to become the, the first African American U.S. Supreme Court Justice and by all accounts was also one of the most brilliant justices in the history of the court. Um, he was an incredibly smart litigator, a great lawyer, and he, you know, as a, as a tribute to that, you know, a lot of people argue that Brown v. Board probably wouldn't have happened for another 10, 15, 20 years had it not been for the brilliance of, of Marshall. Having faced racial segregation throughout his life, this case was personal for him. In front of the Supreme Court, he argued that the concept of separate but equal violated the 14th Amendment's equal protection guarantee. However, the court was not moved by his reasoning and wanted more detail as to what exactly the equal protection clause intended. John W. Davis, the prosecutor in the case, then countered Marshall's argument by stating that racially segregating schools served the needs of the ill-educated Negro students and that despite integration, those of color would never truly feel equal. Moreover, he argued that the Constitution did not require white and African American children to attend the same schools, and as it was a regional custom, the states, as opposed to the federal governments, should be free to regulate their own social affairs. 
On the last day of the court case, Marshall reasserted that such segregation of schools was psychologically damaging and closed his argument by proclaiming that the only motivation of the separate but equal law was to keep the people who were previously slaves as close to that state as possible. The Supreme Court, led by Chief Justice Fred Vinson, heard Brown v. Board in December of 1952. However, they were unable to come to a decision standing deeply divided 4 to 3 to 2, and consequently agreed to have the cases re-argued the following year. In a sudden turn of events, Chief Justice Vinson died in September of 1953, leaving President Dwight D. Eisenhower to appoint Earl Warren as the new Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. On May 17, 1954, Chief Justice Earl Warren announced the Supreme Court's unanimous ruling. We conclude that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. His declaration ended federal tolerance of racial segregation in schools. The unanimous Supreme Court decision, despite being a revolutionary win for people of color, sparked enormous controversy. Almost immediately after Chief Justice Warren finished announcing the unanimous opinion, Southern white political leaders condemned the decision and vowed to defy it. They retaliated against the order of integration by closing the schools. Prince Edward County was the worst affected. All their public schools were closed, and they stayed closed for the next five years. However, some areas were more successful in the process of desegregation. The Little Rock School District Superintendent Virgil Blossom devised a plan of gradual integration, and he invited black student volunteers to attend the Central High School. Nine students from Horseman High School volunteered. On September 3rd, 1957, when they attempted to enter the school, they were turned down by the National Guard on the orders of the Arkansas governor, who argued that it was a proactive approach to prevent violence and maintain peace. President Eisenhower ordered the U.S. Army to Little Rock and federalized the National Guard, which then escorted the Little Rock Nine to their first full day of school. The courageous efforts of the Little Rock Nine are celebrated as one of the earliest victories of the civil rights movement. Today, Today, Central High School stands as an icon for racial equality and social reform. Brown v. Board became the iconic civil rights case of the modern era. In the decade that followed, many subsequent cases and their resulting legislative developments contributed to the transformation of constitutional civil rights. In 1963, the March for Jobs and Freedom took place, where more than 200,000 demonstrators urged the initiation of a strong civil rights bill in Congress. Martin Luther King delivered his memorable I Have a Dream speech. The next year, President Lyndon B. Johnson introduced a legislation called War on Poverty that attacked economic deprivation. Still, some scholars argue that Brown v. Board was unsuccessful in its purported mission to undo school segregation. Nearly half of all black students today attend majority black schools, over 70% of which are in high poverty school districts. Whites continue to finish college at much higher rates than African Americans, one of the the main reasons that the median income of African Americans remains three-fifths that of whites, not much better than 1967. An experiment conducted in 2004 showed that while the white children had an average test score of 1.01, the African Americans only had an average test score of 0.759. This data shows that by the end of a grade level, black students lose substantial ground to white students. So is Brown a failure? No. Not if we consider the boost it gave to a percolating civil rights movement. The progeny of Brown include desegregation of public accommodations and the mostly unhindered right of African Americans to compete for jobs, to vote, and to purchase or rent homes. Brown's greatest accomplishment was its enduring imprint on the national ethos. The idea of second-class citizenship for African Americans, indeed for any minority group, is now universally condemned as a violation of the Constitution and of American values. None of these transformations came easily, and none None are complete, but none would have happened were it not for Brown. Brown v. Board did not transform the nation overnight. Today, 63 years later, there remains room for improvement, for tolerance, for acceptance. There are people that tell us today, take it easy, man, you've made it. Take it from me, it has not been solved. You can't stand still. You must move, and if you don't move, they will run over you. One day, 
when the glory comes.